afternoon. Uh, all right, just a few things at the top and then happy to take your questions. On Tuesday, the 34th Australia-US Ministerial Consultations, known as OSMIN, took place in Annapolis. During a series of productive and substantive discussions, Secretary Austin and Secretary of State Blinken met with their Australian counterparts, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Defense Richard Marles and Minister for Foreign Affairs Penny Wong to further strengthen the U.S.-Australia alliance and the cooperation between our two countries in the Indo-Pacific region and globally. The leaders also reaffirmed that the unbreakable alliance between the United States and Australia is essential to promoting a prosperous and peaceful region. Coming off the heels of yet another momentous trip to the Indo-Pacific region last week, Tuesday's OSMIN caps off a historic two weeks of engagements that have successfully advanced our partnerships and alliances toward a shared vision of a free and open Indo-Pacific. Among the many accomplishments discussed at OSMIN, I'd like to highlight just a few. The United States and Australia reaffirmed their dedication to enhancing force posture cooperation across various domains, including land, maritime, air, and space, ensuring both countries can respond more quickly and effectively in the region. Both nations also announced significant progress on co-production and co-development activities that will strengthen our advanced capabilities, bolster the resilience of our respective defense industrial bases, and ensure we're prepared to respond to regional challenges for decades to come. These efforts, alongside increased rotations of U.S. forces to Australia and expanded trilateral cooperation with Japan, exemplify the deepening resolve and steadfast commitment of the United States and Australia to our shared strategic goals. For more information, you can find a joint statement and the fact sheet regarding yesterday's Osman on the DOD website. I'm sorry, Tuesdays. Separate but related, as we work to bolster strategic partnerships abroad, Secretary Austin and Deputy Secretary Hicks remain deeply committed to accelerating the department's defense innovation, development, and acquisition here at home. In remarks delivered at the NDIA Emerging Technologies for Defense Co Conference yesterday, Deputy Secretary Hicks outlined the progress the department has made over the last four years in driving the sustainable change and innovation necessary to ensuring our armed services have the capabilities on hand to meet our geopolitical moment. Her remarks, as well as a fact sheet outlining the department's lines of effort toward innovation and modernization are available on defense.gov. And jumping in a very different direction once more, I want to take a moment to acknowledge the tremendous success Team USA has displayed at the Olympic Games in Paris, which will officially conclude this weekend. This year, we had nine U.S. Army athletes compete in the Olympic Games. So on behalf of the entire Department of Defense, we want to congratulate Team USA. Thanks for making us proud and for finishing strong. And of course, the entire department looks forward to cheering on three U.S. Army athletes who will compete in the Paralympic Games in Paris later this month. And finally, before I take your questions, I want to take a moment to acknowledge the tensions in the Middle East, as I know many of you are interested in receiving updates. As you are aware, last week, Secretary Austin bolstered our force posture in the region to improve U.S. force protection, increase support for the defense of Israel, and to ensure the United States is prepared to respond to a various number of contingencies. The Secretary and the Department remain intently focused on de-escalating tensions in the region and pushing for a ceasefire as part of the hostage deal to end the war in Gaza. And with that, I'd be happy to take your questions. Tara, would you like to start us off? Sure. Hi, Sabrina. Um, on the Middle East, have, has the department seen any indications by Iran or Hezbollah that an attack is imminent? And besides force posture changes, are there any other uh, development as far as getting Americans out if you need to do an evacuation? Um, so in terms of um, the imminence of any attack, look, I, I can't really speak to that. Um, I certainly wouldn't speak to any intelligence. Um, we've, of course, seen the public messaging um, that has come out, um, whether it be from Hezbollah or from Iran. Um, and that's why the secretary made the decision that he did to bolster our force posture in the region. And of course, our um, commitment to the defense of Israel remains ironclad. Um, and, and I'm sorry, on your second question, could you do you mind Is repeating that? Additional, um, are they taking uh, heightened security measures? I know you've moved additional forces around the region, but um, are they on like the highest level of security <coughs> posture? And then to follow up, uh, mm -hmm. yesterday there were a couple of no-flight warnings issued by countries about not flying over Iranian airspace. Do you take that as an indication that an attack may be imminent? 
Um, for those, uh, I think, equivalent of NOTAMs that were issued by other countries, um, I don't have anything for you on that. I'd refer you to those other countries. My understanding is some of those are routine in nature, um, but I'd refer you to those countries that, that issued that. Um, in terms of our force posture levels, look, of course, uh, we remain um, poised to respond should um, or should we need to be called for the to, for the defense of Israel? Um, I think also in your question you had mentioned um, you know any planning for evacuation, and um, again we're a planning organization. It's something that um, is a capability that of course we have, but right now our main focus is making sure that um, we're postured to make sure that our forces are protected. We're postured to come to the defense of Israel should we need to. Um, but what we really want to see is tensions de-escalate. And you saw the secretary speak to that at his um, uh, press conference on Tuesday, um, the need uh, for this hostage deal to go forward um, or the ceasefire deal to go forward so we can get hostages home. Um, that's really our focus, and that's what we want to see moving forward. Liz. Thanks. Um, on the attack at al-Assad earlier this week, um, how many U.S. service members were injured total? Um, I believe we got uh, seven service members and contractors were injured, but has that number gone up since? Uh, and how many have returned to duty? How many are still seeking treatment? Yeah, no, thanks, uh, Liz, for the question. So initially, our um, assessment was that it was seven personnel that were injured. Um, that was our initial report. It is actually uh, five service members um, that were injured in the attack. Um, after conducting a post-strike analysis, we determined that four service members and one contractor was actually injured in the attack. Um, the other two received you know, very minor injuries and returned to duty right away. Um, and and again, it was it was two personnel initially thought to have been injured during the attack, but were screened by medics, and after that attack, were immediately returned to duty. Um, in terms of the status of the other personnel, um, three of the five injured personnel have been transferred to Landstuhl Regional Medical Center in Germany for additional treatment. The remaining uh, personnel, the one the one service member and contractor, have um, returned to duty and are uh, in the um, region. And can you explain what um, exactly happened? Was it two rockets that impacted the base? Or, you know, how how was this able to get past the U.S. protective? Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. So it was two rockets launched by what we believe to be an Iranian Shia militia group um, that, that impacted al-Assad Air Base in Iraq. Um, there was a third rocket that was intercepted before it impacted the base. In terms of how these rockets got, got through, um, look, that's something that CENTCOM is going to review and, and, and is reviewing right now. Um, we want to make sure that this doesn't happen again. And so CENTCOM is going to adjust and take the proper measures needed to protect our forces in the region. Um, but I don't have more to share right now. Idris. Um, can you provide us an update on Ukraine's incursion into Kursk? Is that consistent with, uh, well, firstly, uh, yeah, is that consistent with the United States' uh, sort of understanding of what Ukraine can and cannot do with U.S. weapons? Uh, thanks for the question. So yes, it is. It is consistent with our policy. Um, and we have supported Ukraine from the very beginning to defend themselves against um, attacks that are coming across the border and for the need for crossfires. Um, so they are taking actions to protect themselves from attacks that are coming from a region that are within the U.S. policy of where they can operate um, you know, our weapons, our systems, our capabilities. Um, in terms of this actual operation that's ongoing in the Kursk region that you've that you've referenced. Um, I'd refer you to the Ukrainians to speak more to that. Um, we are getting more information, um, but really it's for them to speak to their own operations. So, so is the policy then essentially wherever they see an attack emanating from or a grouping of troops? So could that include like Moscow as well if, if they saw some sort of preparation for them to then go into Moscow? Is that... That would, again, we don't support long range attacks into Russia. These are more for crossfire. I'm not going to put a specific range on it, as you know. They, they, they are aware of the U.S. policy and what we are supportive of. Um, I think you know from the very beginning, we are supportive of Ukraine and their success on the battlefield. But as the dynamics have shifted on the battlefield, they've been able to actually push the Russians back further into Russian territory. But as they see attacks coming across the border, they have to be able to 
um, have the capabilities to respond. And so you're seeing some of these cross-border counterfire measures that they're being able to take um, that are near the border of Ukraine. We don't support long-range attacks into Ukraine. We've said that from the very beginning. I'm not going to draw, you know, a circular map here for you of where they can and can't strike, but we've we've been very clear on with the Ukrainians. Janie. Thank you, Ms. Sabrina. Two questions on the North Korea and Ukraine. Sure. First question, uh, as you know, North Korea's Kim Jong-un announced that 250 new tactical ballistic missile launchers have been deployed to the front lines. What impact do you think this will have on the U.S. and South Korea missile defense system? Uh, thanks, Janie. So I haven't actually seen that announcement, but any type of actions that can, that further destabilize the region and what we've seen from um, the DPRK, it's actions just like that that continue to um, hurt relationships in the region, further destabilize the region. Um, but I don't have anything specific on, on that report. But it's threatening to Korean Peninsula, but the U.S. Yeah, I don't have anything more specific to add to that. Mm -hmm. Second question. Uh, it was reported that uh, North Korea armored vehicles was found at the uh, battlefield in Ukraine. Uh, in, is North Korea-Russia military cooperation actually uh, taking place after the military uh, treaty between Putin and Kim Jong-un? So I think we what we've seen is a deepening partnership and cooperation between the DPRK and Russia. Um, and we've been very clear about our concerns of that deepening alliance, um, along with Iran as well, supplying uh, munitions and capability to Russia as they continue to wage an illegal and unlawful war against their sovereign neighbor. Um, in terms of this armored vehicle that you're referenced, I, I have candidly have not seen that report. Um, but we know that the DPRK is providing military assistance to Russia. Um, what I can say is what we're focused on. And what we're focused on is making sure that Ukraine has what it needs to be, success to be successful on the battlefield. Um, you've seen us roll out pre presidential drawdown authority packages um, you know, pretty consistently. Uh, we're going to continue to do that. And um, of course, Ukraine has the backing of the Ukraine Defense Contact Group that the secretary convenes almost monthly. Um, and I think that is a strong sh showing of support from the United States and countries, like-minded countries all around the world uh, for Ukraine. Yeah, Joe. Thanks. Um, back to Liz's question. Sure. <clears throat> On that uh, strike or attack, can we, I mean, so the secretary said, I think a couple days ago that um, no attacks, or the U.S. won't accept any attacks on its personnel in the region. We saw a couple attacks on U.S. forces in the last couple weeks. We haven't seen the U.S. respond to any of those. We saw a self-defense strike on July 31st, and then this strike came. So can we expect a U.S. response? We always reserve the right to respond at a time and place of our choosing. I'm certainly not going to get ahead of the secretary or any decisions that he makes in conjunction with uh, the president and the National Security Council, but we always reserve that right, and we will take measures that we need to um, to ensure uh, the protection of our forces. Just one more on the, um, the self-defense strike on July 31st. Is there any additional information that you can share in terms of if there were any uh, if anybody was killed in that in that strike, if, because there's been reports that there were actually some uh, Houthi members or fighters in Iraq at the time. Um, I would refer you to CENTCOM for, for more details on that strike. And just one last sure. one on Gaza. Have you, has the department seen a day after plan yet from its Israeli counterparts? On for a day after planning Gaza. That's something that we continue to urge for, uh, urge for um, with our, you know, with the secretary's call with, calls with Minister Gallant. Um, we continue to urge to see, you know, what does planning look like when the war ends. Um, it's not something that I'm going to get into details on from here, um, but it's something that we are in and always communicating with um, the Israelis on, whether it be from here in this building or from throughout the interagency. It's something that we're very mindful of and, and want to make sure that there is a plan in place for when this war ends. And I think 
getting to your larger question here, the best way for that for a plan to be put into place is we need to see this the ceasefire deal um, come to fruition. Uh, we need to see you know hostages come back to their loved ones. Um, that's the best way in ensuring the next step forward to move forward what a transition plan looks like. You're urging them, but have you seen a, a plan? From yeah, I don't have. I'm not going to be able to provide more this time. Yeah. When it comes to uh, I'm sorry, I don't think I know your name. John Hendren with Al Jazeera English. Nice to meet you. Uh, when it comes to a potential attack by Iran or its affiliates on Israel, is the U.S. force posture purely defensive? Is it possible uh, offensive capabilities would be used? Are there limits? Our, our, po our force posture within the Middle East, especially when it comes to, um, you know, protecting our forces, coming to the defense of Israel, is defensive in nature. Um, and you saw from the very beginning, um, you know, on October 8th, when the secretary directed uh, the USS Ford Carrier Strike Group to move to the region, um, and then uh, a few days later also directed the Ike to move to the region, um, what you're seeing now is bolstered force posture. Um, that has evolved over time as, um, you know, the, the, you know, engagements in the region have gone on. Um, but everything that we're doing is defensive in nature, including Operation Prosperity Guardian, um, that is continuing to engage um, you know, very dangerous threats and, and missile projections from the Houthis on an almost daily basis. That is a defensive coalition in nature. It, it is there to protect commercial shipping through the Red Sea, through the BAM. Um, that's exactly what our forces are doing there. Might that change if there were an attack on U.S. forces in the region? I'm not going to get into any hypotheticals here. Mike, did I see? No? Never mind. Yes. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Uh, just getting back uh, to sure. Iraq. You know the Iraq government, government is responsible for protecting U.S. forces in the country. But uh, I don't know if the Prime Minister of Iraq is not willing or does not have the control to rein in uh, these militia groups to protect U.S. forces. So what measures are you going to take? Well, I just, before I walked up here, I saw that the Iraqi government arrested five people in, that were uh, considered responsible for the attack on U.S. forces um, at Al-Assad Air Base, and we certainly welcome those actions. Um, we have a good partnership with the Iraqi government. Um, and what I will say is, is is sort of to what Joe was asking me about is, I'm not going to telegraph or get ahead of the secretary, but we always will take measures to protect our forces. Um, and should we decide to respond, it will be at a time and place of our choosing. And I wouldn't be announcing that from the podium. Thank you. Yes, go back. Same issue. Uh, this time, a, a new group in Iraq, they called themselves Sauryun. They pushed a statement and they claimed the responsibility for this attack. So, but still, you have not labeled any militia groups in Iraq which were behind this attack. So, do you welcome or do you buy, do, sorry, do you buy this statement by this Iraqi militia groups that they were behind this attack? And why it takes so long for you to determine which group was behind this attack? We know that it is a Iranian-backed Shia militia group that is responsible for this attack. Um, am I going to go into our intelligence assessments here from the podium with you? I'm just not going to do that. Um, but, you know, I, I haven't seen the statement from this group. Um, what I can tell you is we always reserve the right to respond to protect our forces. Um, and I'm just going to have to leave it at that. Has the Iraqi government requested you to not attack these groups, to not respond to these groups because they are taking care of those who were responsible for that? And I think that there were some reports from the Iraqi media that the U.S. were involved in arresting these members of the militia groups who were behind this attack. Have you been involved in this arrest? I'm not aware of U.S. forces being involved in the arrest of um, individuals that were responsible for the attack. Um, we pass on intelligence when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, we are, we're always coordinating with the Iraqi government. And, of course, um, you know, in close coordination when it comes to an attack on U.S. forces and making sure that the Iraqi government um, is aware that, and we've said this both publicly and privately in our conversations, that we will um, always do what we need to do to protect our forces. And if that means a response, uh, we will take it. But I have nothing to telegraph for you from here um, and just not going to get into any other intel. I requested you to not respond to this attack because they are taking care of this issue? I don't have anything for you on that, and I don't have any calls to read out. I'm going to come back in the room, but I'm just going to go to the phone before I forget. Uh, Jeff Shogel, Task and Purpose. Uh, thank you. 
Have there been any more attacks on U.S. troops in Iraq and Syria since the al-Assad attack? And the foiled attack on Taylor Swift concerts, was that, does DOD know, was that planned by ISIS leadership in Syria, or is it proof that low-level haters got a hate? <laughs> All right, well, thanks, Jeff, for uh, the question. Um, in terms of... Um, uh, <laughs> In terms of any attacks on U.S. forces or any additional attacks on U.S. forces um, since the initial attack at Al-Assad Air Base, I'm, I'm not aware of any, um, but I'd refer you to CENTCOM uh, for any more details. Um, in terms of the um, thwarted ISIS plot on um, the Taylor Swift um, concerts in Vienna, you know, I think we know all too well the threat of ISIS, and we will always do what we need with our partners and allies in passing on, um, whether it be intelligence or any support, uh, when it comes to ISIS or any threats that our partners or allies might face anywhere in the world. Um, I don't have more for you other than that, but uh, thanks for the question. Uh, last question from the phone, Chris Gordon, Air, Air and Space. Uh, thanks, Sabrina. Um, on the additional forces in the Middle East, the statement last week, your statement said um, DOD is also taking steps to increase our readiness to deploy additional land-based ballistic missile defense. Could you clarify what that means? Is the U.S. deploying more ground-based um, uh, ballistic uh, missile defense to the region? Uh, I'm not asking what systems or where. It's just a yes, no. Yeah, thanks, uh, Chris. So th that was referring to additional units that have been placed on uh, PTDO orders, um, but none that have deployed to the region at this time. Matt. Thanks, Sabrina. Can you give us an update on any of those force posture augmentations announced for the Middle East? CENTCOM announced F-22s yep. arriving. Do you have any updates on any vessels, air defense, or other aircraft arriving in the region? I think that's our biggest um, uh, announcement to to make, I think you saw as Cent, as you mentioned, CENTCOM announcing that additional F twenty twos have um, landed in the region and are there to augment the forces that are that are already there um, with the um, TR that's already in the CENTCOM AOR, and then of course you have additional destroyers and cruisers moving closer to Israel to help with the defense of Israel. Should should it come to that? Um, but it's really the F-22s that CENTCOM announced earlier this um, earlier this morning. Okay. Do you anticipate more arriving in coming days, or do you have any timeline you can give us? I don't have anything more additional or timelines to announce at this time. Yes, Brad. Yeah, thanks. So just on the Ukraine attacks into Russia, are you concerned that Russia will escalate tensions over this attack, uh, including with the U.S., nuclear threats, anything like that? Uh, no, because at the end of the day, Ukraine is fighting for its sovereign territory that its neighbor invaded. So if we want to de-escalate tensions, uh, as we've said from the beginning, the best way to do that is Putin can make that decision today um, to withdraw troops from, from Ukraine. Um, Ukraine is going to do everything it can to continue to take back its sovereign territory. And that's what they're, what we're seeing they're doing um, in this, uh, what you're referring to in this, you know, uh, Kursk uh, oblast. Um, we're going to continue to support Ukraine with the capabilities and the systems that they need. Um, we don't feel like this is escalatory in any way. Um, Ukraine is doing what it needs to do to be successful on the battlefield. Yes. Thank you, Sabrina. Um, I have two questions. The first one, um, can you speak uh, a little bit about uh, to why F-22 fighter jets is in the region of this time? I mean, uh, which they are not generally thought as a defensive platform. Actually, they, they can be a very invaluable defensive platform. Um, they add a maneuverability, a... Um, uh, additional systems that allow the commander to have more versatile options. Um, and I think it sends a, a very clear signal um, to the region that we want to see tensions de-escalate. Um, and it sends a, a really, I think, powerful message of deterrence. Um, uh, second question, regarding to the call between uh, Secretary Austin and his Egypt, uh, Egyptian uh, counterpart today, sure. um, does the Secretary Austin believe that the U.S. allies in the region will help uh, this time uh, the U.S. Um, like what they did in April regarding to the Iranian uh, attack? 
Um, do you have any uh, insurance from them that they will exactly they will do that like what they did in April? Thank so you. I appreciate the question, but of course, just not going to go down this hypothetical route of of, of what could happen. Um, I think you know. We, we have a, a great, strong partnership with Egypt. You saw the readout of the call, which I'm sorry I should have mentioned um, that, that a readout is available on defense.gov. I just don't have more to add other than I would say that I would let other allies and partners in the region speak for themselves. Yeah, of course. Noah. Um, there was a story yesterday about U.S. responses to Houthi attacks and then the defensive strikes that have taken place in the last 10 months that listed very specific numbers of munitions that the U.S. has used. Are you familiar with whether those are accurate? I don't know the, the story that you're referencing, and I, I wouldn't comment on any specifics at this point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sabrina. Um, as the situation in Venezuela evolves, is the DOD supplying options to policymakers? <laughs> uh, in terms of what? In terms of a potential employment of forces, uh, in terms of a potential use of maybe Navy assets, uh, especially since uh, vessels from the Chinese and the Russian navies are mooring in Venezuela. Yeah, this is something that I would refer you to my State Department colleagues on. I'm not aware of any plans of, of DOD getting involved in any way. Um, it's something that we monitor from here as a department, um, but this is really something that state should speak to. Um, we want to see, uh, you know, I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. I'll let my State Department colleagues take it from there. Yes. Thank you very much, Sabrina and Sasiakar. Um, Last week, your colleagues at the State Department, I asked them uh, whether the Taliban regime in Afghanistan are a terrorist organization or not. Uh, and they said that they are, prob they are pretty sure that they are a terrorist organization. Is that the kind of statement uh, they should be giving after you spending 20 years there losing 2,500 soldiers, which in my journalism, I know that they are not declared as a terrorist organization by U.S. Justice Department, the TTP is. Uh, and General Patrick here standing also said that TTP and ISIS are serious threats and, you know, U.S. is keeping. So what do you feel uh, as a military spokesperson about the State Department officials with such a casual attitude about Taliban? I mean, I haven't seen the, dir the direct transcript here, and I think you're, you're paraphrasing a bit. But look, I would say that uh, there's no question that my colleagues at the State Department, this administration, takes the threat of the Taliban very seriously. Um, we know intimately the uh, pain and suffering they've inflicted on um, the people in their own country. Um, I don't have anything more to offer other than to say that I don't think it, it was meant to be considered a flippant comment by them. I'd certainly refer you to them for, for more, but um, this administration knows deeply the the um, the pain that they've inflicted. Thank you very much. And one last question. Uh, Jerusalem Post yesterday reported that uh, Pakistan might give uh, Shaheen 3 cruise uh, ballistic missile to Iran in case of uh, um, intense, uh, uh, if, if something uh, more crazy happens between Iran and Israel. Um, is Pentagon taking this uh, serious? I mean, because there is obviously conflict. Pakistan Foreign Office issued a statement once. They put the name of Israel there. A few hours later, they removed the name of Israel there. The Senate passed a resolution condemning Israel. Uh, and now Jerusalem Post has reported this. Uh, is the U.S. at all concerned that maybe if some different regime like Imran Khan comes, who is obviously criticizing Israel from sitting in jail, what, what is Pentagon looking at? Yeah, I don't have a response to it because I haven't seen the report. Um, and sorry, I'm just going to have to leave it at that. Charlie. Sabrina, thank you. So a couple of weeks ago, the Russians had threatened to arm Houthi rebels with anti-ship uh, ballistic missiles. Shortly after that, we saw Russian warships anchored off the coast of Yemen, and that was being tracked. Now, with this new incursion, with these continued Russian threats, how closely are you seeing collusion or the relationship between the Russians and the Houthis? So I've seen the reporting on that. Um, we haven't seen a – we've seen Russia previously express um, or trying to uh, seek relationships with organizations, countries that have um, – 
you know, or or that are engaged in um, behaviors that, you know, are opposed to what the United States is. Um, I don't have anything more for you, but we haven't seen Russia supplying the Houthis with any type of capabilities. Um, it's something that we'll continue to monitor, but I just don't have more for you right now on that. Can I just follow sure. you up on, on the ISIS question, too? Yeah. Do what the haters got to hate. Yeah, please do. Well, yeah. not for that particular part, but... Do you I have think, any more Taylor Swift references no, that you want That's me to respond to? I'm afraid not. Okay. Um, the question was, and I want to drill down a little bit closer into sure. that, would you have seen if this was a more serious level of ISIS coordination? Was there, in terms of the intelligence, in terms of our U.S. forces uh, in that region, that this is something more than a couple of radicalized, self-radicalized individuals? Well... Thanks for the question. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll reiterate that what I said to, to Jeff is that we know all too well the threat of ISIS. Um, and in terms of this specific threat that impacted concerts in Vienna, I'm just not going to be able to speak more to that intelligence right now. Um, but it is something that the intelligence community continues to um you know, as always, monitor. We've seen ISIS pose threats, whether it be in Europe, in Asia, and in Africa. It is something that we are deeply, deeply concerned about. Um, so we're certainly not out of the woods when it comes to um, ISIS, but um, it's something that, um, you know, a global coalition of like-minded nations have come together to continue to address um, all around the world. And that's what you saw uh, when it comes in this instance or other instances. We're always going to share intelligence um, with our allies and partners, and even with those countries that we don't have the best of relationships with. You saw um, us have a duty to warn uh, with those attacks that happened in Russia. That's something that we did because we were concerned about that ISIS threat that had developed. So it's something that we're going to continue to monitor. Um, just leave it at that. Okay. Did we have one more? Well, one okay, more sure. Uh, there have been new clashes between uh, Iranian-backed Arab tribes and the Kurdish uh, forces, uh, Syrian Democratic forces. To your knowledge, have U.S. forces <coughs> engaged in the fight, or does it affect the campaign against ISIS? Uh, I'm I'm not aware of U.S. forces engaging. Yeah, I'll have to leave it at that. Thanks. All right, thanks everyone. Happy Thursday.